Good morning, right, Danny. Doing? I'm good, thanks. Everybody gets their cuddle. I, I hope you're all right with that. It's that, good aye. to meet you. Nice to meet you too. How are you? Thank you for coming. I'm good. I am smashing. I'm all right. What about you? You all right? I'm good, I. Good. I was just yeah. thinking before I met you, I'm like, out of everybody that I've had in my car, are you all right with a wee Starbucks? You can have a cold drink if you don't want a hot drink. No, the radio off. I've not had my coffee yet this morning. Um, I just got up, got ready, came out. So I'm quite looking forward to getting you wee coffee. coffee. Um, aye, so I was just thinking before I came that uh, actually, every day I've had my car, you're probably the person I've known least about. Because you're not actually a huge social media person. But what you do post is really impactful. Yeah. So that's what I was thinking to myself. So why don't you just give us a wee introduction of who you are and then what you don't say. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say it and ask you about. Okay, that's fair I guess. Um, I don't know, but my name's Danny. Um, I'm in recovery from alcohol and drug addiction. Been in recovery for just over two years. Um, Two and a half years. Or is it two it's, and a half years for the cocaine? So it's two and a half and for cocaine and right. two years and one month for alcohol. I need to stop you for every second. No, Don't ask you what you want. What are you having? Can I have a oat milk flat white, please? Hi, welcome to Starbucks. What can I get for you? Hi, uh, can I have an oat milk flat white, please? Oat milk flat white? Is that all the common one size? Um, a medium oat milk latte. Medium oat milk latte. Do you want a wee snack or that? I'm alright. No, that's fine, thank you. Perfect, I'll just get you down to the next window. That's five, thank you. Thank you. Um, and you don't actually, so you, but you're not a big social media guy, are you? No, um, no, not at all really. Um, I had an old account back when I was in active addiction and I had a few thousand followers on it and it was just, to be honest, I was just a cheeky wee bastard on it. <laughs> That's, um, and I, I'm still were... quite cheeky, but now I'm now I'm nice about it. I think because uh, what I've what I've come to understand in my recovery journey is that hurt people hurt people. So I think I, in the past I, I could be quite. Uh, I don't think people probably wouldn't say I was nasty, but you know I was quite cheeky. But at and least that got me a Aye. I'm old account, but no, on this account I don't. On Twitter, are on you Twitter, talking about, yeah. aye, because that's where I first discovered you. I know you mm -hmm. are on Instagram and we'll talk about that, but it was Twitter. Even though I'm no active on Twitter, but obviously it's brilliant for keeping up to speed with everything, what's going on, current affairs, whatever. That's why I like it. But that was where I first um, discovered you. So, but at least you had the self-awareness. You know, you know that you were being a cheeky but I've um, no did something about it there's plenty of people is that the coconut one I that's fab thank you there's plenty of people that's fab thank you there's plenty of people out there you. who you know are only very nice either on social media or in person and really don't want to do anything about it so give yourself a pat in the back for that no, you know quite happy to be whatever they are on um, social media but anyway I am interrupting you so <laughs> I guess um, I'm going to go around here because it's usually quiet. Right? Aye. Mm -hmm. I just started being pretty honest and open. Because um, recovery recovery's quite personal. Um, so I, I'm in, I go to 12 step fellowships where the emphasis is on an anonymity. And um, a lot of people don't talk about it publicly, and that's, that's completely fine. Um, but my. The way I wanted to be with it was, um, well, the way I thought about it was, most of my damage that I caused when I was in active addiction was pretty public anyway. So, you know, what have I got to hide? Um, mm -hmm. So I just started being honest and posting honestly about uh, where I'm at, how I'm feeling, how my journey's going, and a lot of the. Although I don't have a huge phone, quite a lot of my posts. End up going, going viral. viral. Uh, that's how so, I, I um, knew about you. Yeah, I know, which is a bit mental because you just post these like raw things about how you're feeling, as you say, and thousands, and I mean, we're talking like hundreds of thousands of people 
either like it, share it, or relate to it. Yeah. So I think you're quite well known for that. Yeah, I think I had, and I think as to my old account, most of the people that follow me were football fans, and in my new account, most of the people that follow me are probably people who have an interest in recovery, and that's kind of where that probably sums up where my life is today. Like, um, because my big part, I still like football, but that was that ruled my life. You know, mm-hmm. my mm-hmm. football team didn't do well. I was angry or sad or I'd drink on it. If it did do well, I'd drink on it anyway, you know. Mm-hmm. I'd be celebrating or whatever. And I just lived my life through that. Um, and, you know, but that's kind of, I don't know, I guess being honest and upfront online and, and um, for me, it helps me. But um, also through that, a lot of people reach out to me because they feel mm-hmm. maybe safe in the fact that they know that I'm being upfront and honest and I won't judge them about anything that they feel or how they're what they're going through mm-hmm. um, so just to put it into perspective and I only know this because you posted it you were you've recovered from spending a grand a month uh, recovered from a grand a month cocaine habit that was the first thing yeah. that you and to me like I'm thinking what does that even look like? What does a grand a month on cocaine actually look like? What is that? Is that a hundred quid a day every single day in life, or what? So I actually, um, I've, one of the things, uh, <laughs> one of the things that probably stopped me from getting recovery sooner um, is the fact that I was a, a binge user. So Dang. I wasn't a daily top top drunk. So. Um, and alcoholism and an addiction, there's there's loads of different types of alcoholics and addicts. Um, and you get people who are daily top top drunks who wake up to a bottle of vodka every morning, who can't function um, without a drink or another substance, whatever their substance is. It could be over the counter prescription painkillers, it could be uh, cocaine, it could be heroin. So you have daily habitual users. Um, and I used to see them as addicts. and that would separate me from accepting what I, that I suffer from mm-hmm. addiction as well. And you'd mind you were alright because you weren't doing it job. every day. Mm-hmm. I hadn't really, I didn't have much to lose, so, I, you know, I didn't have a house, I couldn't lose a house, I couldn't, you know, my health was actually pretty okay. Um, mm-hmm. But at, at the weekends, um, I would spend three, four hundred pounds on cocaine every weekend. Um, so that's what it was, that's yeah. how you, three then, or four hundred quid, um, and that, so, is that just getting up? No, finishing your work on a Friday night. Yeah. And just... So I would be all day Friday. So uh, although I didn't drink every day uh, or use every day, it affected my life every day. Because uh, all week I'd be, looking, I'd be focusing on Friday. Just get th- mm-hmm. get to Friday. Mm-hmm. Get through this week and get to Friday. And a lot and of then... coaches talk about that, like dealing with people in recovery, that it's like they're busiest on a Monday when, you know, people like yourself have been hitting it hard, mad with it all weekend and can he cope yep. then on a Monday with the week ahead. So that kind of rings true with what you're saying about living for the Friday. Where where did it start for you? Because what are you, 33? 33. Oh, that was good for me, <laughs> for <Yeah. Matt. laughs> uh, where did it? Where did it start? Can you pinpoint it, or was it just a gradual thing? It's funny, because when I first came into recovery, I thought that it was quite a recent development, and then I remembered that I used to go, um, at the age of 15, 16, I was taking 500 ml bottles of Coke with some Jack Daniels in it to school. Um, oh my God! And I didn't, I, I couldn't, like, that was gone from my memory. I couldn't remember that that happened until mm. I started to unpack sort of more recent stuff and then get further back. Um, so I think I've used, although I, that, although, um, so I think from the very first time I, I drank, I drank alcoholically. And what that means to me is that I was drinking to get a sense of ease and comfort. And once you feel that, my understanding of addiction is that um, it's a dopamine hit. Mm-hmm. So you're suffering from something, normally an adverse childhood experience or psychological trauma. And you put you, it, it doesn't have to be a substance, it could be a behaviour, but something that you've done, not, you know, for me it was a substance. The first time I drank, I felt that dopamine hit and I felt all right. 
and I could cope with who I was as a person inside and I could regulate my emotions and I could speak to people and I could do all the things that normal people can do day to day without mm -hmm. a substance. Mm -hmm. um, and what and my understanding of the scientific process behind it is that your brain registers that dopamine hit and goes, that felt nice. And the next time, you're, so brains are very clever, but they're also quite stupid. So they look for the easiest solution. So the next time that you feel low or you feel down, the brain goes, I don't remember what happened the last time you felt like this. And, and then you mm -hmm. felt better after you had a drink. So then you want to drink again. Um, that's my basic understanding of addiction. And that can be behavioural. So it could be, um, it could be codependent relationships. It can be uh, some people, I, I, I don't know, it might be controversial, but I used to sell farm as an addiction. Because mm -hmm. it's, it's the same I as I believe that. it is. And by the way, you can say anything you want. Don't well, worry about anything <clears throat> you say. <laughs> so, um, I, I've, I've got experience in self-harm, I've got experience in codependent relationships. Um, it can be... Uh, so when I first got into recovery, I started hitting the gym five days a week. Mm. That was just me, another dopamine hit. And then the, obviously you've got the obvious ones that people see day to day. You've got alcoholism and you've got drug abuse. Um, so that's my understanding of addiction is that it doesn't need to be a substance, it can be a behaviour. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, and it's born from, from my experience and most of the people I've met in recovery, it's born from childhood trauma. Mm -hmm. And it's that. And that doesn't have to be um, physical abuse. It can mm -hmm. be something as simple as um, parental divorce, mm -hmm. or it can it be... It can also be something out with your family. It can be, yeah. Uh, yeah, and I think, because I've talked about adverse childhood experience in the past, not when I've been doing this, because it's never actually came up, but I think there's a bit of a narrative out there of, with lots of things, and it includes this, where if you say that adverse, adverse childhood experience, people automatically think of the absolute worst in terms of your family. Yep. You know, that it was either child abuse or something like that. But in actual fact, any experience that has adversely affected you as a child, as an ad that yep. then goes on to impact your life, which in the research that I have done, the same as what you're saying, everything that we are as adults think, believe, behave, act, whatever, ultimately comes from what you experienced as a child. Yep. So there will be something, there's something adversely wrong with you now, that there's quite a high chance that it was something that happened to you Definitely. when you, aye, when you were a child. It, and it, it could be, be familiar, aye. it can be, it could be an experience in school, it could be <clears throat> bullying at school, it can be anything, but, mm -hmm. and even if it is in the family, um, it doesn't, ha it doesn't have to be physical abuse, it can be um, like a parental separation, or you could have two loving parents who just work too hard, mm -hmm. who aren't emotionally available to you as a child. It can be, um, no, it, it's not, it doesn't have to be deliberate. Mm -hmm. It can be your, that your parents experienced that first childhood experience and they didn't have the capabilities to care mm -hmm. for you as a child. Mm -hmm. That's not their fault. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also, so my view on it is it's not, what happened to me is not my fault. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I, I do agree. believe that I have the power and to a certain degree mm -hmm. the responsibility to make sure it stops with me. And so if I have children in the future, I'll, I'll make mistakes. Don't I'll do it, up. Darry, <laughs> Don't do it. Take it from me. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'm only joking. I'll make mistakes. I better say that. Up, but I'll, be, I'll try and be honest mm -hmm. and I'll try and create a, an environment where you know, I, I promote them to, to speak freely about their emotions and I don't, you know, punish them for crying if they're boys or, mm -hmm. you know, mould them into something that they're not oh God, or, I hope they're girls or, you know. I just, hope as a society <clears throat> we're moving away from that shite. I think we are getting there, but there's still, it's still there, isn't it? And it's, yeah. all, it's to me, um, trauma's intergenerational. It comes, you know, you, you, you're not, it's not, a, it's not a deliberate act normally. Mm -hmm. that, 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 you know, mm -hmm. there's very severe cases where it is obviously physical mm -hmm. abuse, but mm -hmm. my experience of most people in addiction is that they've not experienced deliberate acts of trauma. Mm -hmm. um, it's been no, I would agree with that as well. It's very, there's a lot of, and is this the right word? I don't know. I don't even know if it's a current thing, but back in the day, I think there was a lot more, and I'm older than you, but there was a lot more ignorance about, about, about how 
can't get my words out because I'm trying to be as, um, you know, I don't want to say something that's going to upset anybody, but it's about being aware. Now, I think there's more awareness of what impacts a child than yeah. there was back in the day, is what I'm trying to say. Um, and if there was awareness back then, um, they just fucking ignored it. <laughs> so that's, I suppose, what I'm saying. So, see, so you're talking about adverse childhood experience there. Is that something that you talk about? Um, what affected you? Or do you not talk about that? Do you just talk about recognising it? I talk about recognising it because nothing happened. I didn't have any abusers or anything like that. Nothing happened to me in childhood. Um, you know, I, I think it's more important to talk about how I felt growing up as a child rather right. than the cause of what right. happened. Right, So um, how did you feel? I grew up feeling... I felt different from everybody else. Um, I felt like I didn't fit in with people in school. Um, I, I felt like... At some points in life, I felt like everybody else had a handbook on how to do life, and I didn't. And like, I just mm -hmm. didn't know, mm -hmm. you know. But you, but you know now that's obviously not true. I know, yeah. Because uh, we all, we all, I think we all think that uh, at some point in time. I know I did. Yeah. I can't speak for everybody else, but I know that I did. That's where my name comes from. <laughs> the Instagram, <laughs> the misfit. Um, but I, sorry, I'm interrupting you. So say about your what you're saying about. So that's that's kind of how I felt, and I felt. Um, and I, and a lot of my stuff comes from um, doesn't come from family. So mm -hmm. I had in primary school I was an overachiever. Um, I did well in school. I was quite clever um, in primary school. And from a very young age there was like like school teachers would be like, oh you you're going to do well. You're going to go to you know you're going to go to a good university and you're going and that that was from like the age of eight, nine, ten when I was mm -hmm. in. They were bringing by primary six. They were bring, bringing me exams from high school to to sit, um, and it was just all this expectation put mm -hmm. on me from a young age um, that I was going to achieve, and then that built in me, and it like I had high expectations of myself then, and I developed mm -hmm. a, a thing that I still do in adulthood where if I don't think I'm going to absolutely smash something, I'll make sure it's me that fucks it up. So. Mm -hmm. Um, so I self-sabotage a lot, and I did that in school. Um, as soon as, you know, standard grades were fine, but as soon as it got to hires and it got a bit more difficult and needed a bit more study, um, I just stopped turning up to school. That's um, probably when I started to... Because I'd never experienced, like, difficulty in, in education. And then mm -hmm. when I did, it was just kind of like... Mm -hmm. There wasn't a lot of support there for me. I'm in the process at the moment of being diagnosed with ADHD. So, I know, I saw, I know, and we'll come back to that, because so. that's another thing. I actually think I'm on the spectrum as well. And the last time I said this, loads of people messaged me saying, I think there's loads of people think that about themselves, um, because there is now an awareness of what it is. Yep. Um, but, I so it's interesting to hear your story about being an overachiever. And the pressure of that, that was actually probably the catalyst for what then transpired your, the rest of your life from what you're saying. I'm not, you know, you're no better than me. Um, but that's, it's, I think now schools, with my experience with Lola going to school, there's very much an emphasis on treating everybody equally. And I think that's why what you've just described, yeah. what happens to somebody if you put pressure on them, um, you know, as they go, it's not even deliberate pressure. As you say, no, it's, it's just not. this, oh wow, you're so amazing. And it's how you absorb it that, you know, has been learned to not be that beneficial for any child. Yeah. Um, so what did you go on to do? Do you talk about that? What you, you know, um, Adult wise job, whatever. If you don't want to talk about your no, job, that's totally um, fine because there's loads of other stuff. But I just did want to ask you because you had said about the self sabotage. And I left school and went into youth work actually because um, I'd been brought up through, I, I was going to youth centres um, mm -hmm. in any school bride um, and I started volunteering so that I became a youth worker. But then in 2010, some funding changes happened and it was mm -hmm. like a Basically, 
I think there was a pledge by the government to cut classroom sizes. And all they did in order to achieve that was take funding from education non-teaching and put it into education teaching. Mm -hmm. So the funding for things like youth work, etc. Yeah, cetera, uh, got cut massive. in order to fund schooling. Um, that was in 2010 and my position just um, wasn't available anymore. So I then went to, uh, uh, basically, from there on out, I was I worked in sales, um, construction mm -hmm. originally, and now pharmaceutical sales. Um, but <gasps> you work for a big pharma. Not a big pharma, work for a like a. I know, a and do you know, company, but, I, um, I was just going to say, there's a lot of controversy out there, especially now with COVID having happened about the big farmers. But whilst you know, like I say, there's a lot of controversy about how much impact the big farmers have in the actual whole running of the world. <laughs> they are also huge employers to a lot of people yeah. so you it's, know it's analytical i work in as well so I, I, we supply testing labs I, I don't i don't supply drugs um, and mm -hmm. supply equipment to mm -hmm. labs that are doing food drug testing that kind of thing yeah so. which is very interesting but anyway i didn't want to i didn't no. get you here to ask <laughs> you about your job that just uh, digressed a wee bit so <clears throat> in terms of the addiction at what point so you're two and a half years off the cocaine, like you say, but I'm assuming it wasn't just one day you woke up and went, all oh, right, eh, I better do something about this. Because usually when you speak to addicts or anybody with any form of addiction, it's a gradual process to get yep. to the actual, right, you know, that's me, off it or whatever. So what, sh what happened so, to you? Like, we're kind of, I've picked this up from other people saying it and I kind of identify with it, but there's, there was three stages to my using. There was like the party stage where everything was fun. And then there was a party with chaos when, like, there was fun, mental. but the mm -hmm. stuff was going a bit too far, or, you know, and I spent a long time, some of my drug bills were more than the money I was bringing in, so you need to start getting creative about how you can pay your drug bills. So you're borrowing off friends and not paying them back, and you're doing the same to family, and, you know, so that, that becomes really unmanageable, and it's, um, it's a horrible place to be, actually, where you don't know, how am I going to, how am I going to fund it? Fund it, and then you've got considering you beat yourself up all your life, and you're now using because you beat yourself up. You start beating yourself up more. My pals are going to hate me because I borrow money off them. I can't afford to pay them back. Um, you know, and it, that can break down friendships. It can break down families. But that's mm -hmm. a, so then. So that's the middle stage for me. Is the party and the chaos, and then the third stage is just chaos. That's when the drugs have stopped working. So you no mm -hmm. longer get the sense of ease and comfort anymore. You're no longer enjoying yourself. You're sitting in your living room at four in the morning on a Sunday using on your own, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, towards the end of my using, I was taking cocaine everywhere. And um, in respect of like, I would wake up and I, would, I was using it in the morning. It no longer become like, a finishing work and going and using mm -hmm. type thing. Um, you felt like it was getting you through your day then, yeah. or you needed it and to get it, it through, through your day. Um, and I would, it would be, so yeah, it's, so it started off party, you know, oh, I quite enjoy this, this is making me feel good, to a bit of party with a bit of chaos, and then to just in the end, you know, pure chaos, no partying, no, no fun, no enjoyment. And how long did the, the chaos last for before you came off it? How long did you live like that for? Um, I think I had really, like, my life was pretty unmanageable for a good 10 years. Bloody hell, 10 um, years, man. Particularly bad for sort of the final two to three years where, where, where there was no enjoyment anymore. Um, it was just... And did you try throughout that time to come off it at any point? Yeah, I tried to cut down quite often. And actually, see, most years I would do, like, dry January, and that would help convince me that I didn't have a problem. Because mm -hmm. um, I could stop for a month. But you're counting down the days in January. You know, I did all these things. Um, I tried, I'll just go out and drink. That never worked. I'd get one pint in and I'd want drugs. Or um, I'll try and no drink pints. I'll just drink spirits. Or I'll try and no drink spirit. I tried everything, you know, mm -hmm. to moderate. Um, my experience is that um, 
the only thing that's worked for me is total abstinence from everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing that's worked for me. It's also one of the only recovery methods that seems to, the governments and the healthcare system don't really want to talk about or promote abstinence-based mm -hmm. recovery very much. Mm -hmm. They're getting a bit better now, but they're, they're not there. The focus is very much on either, you know, for um, opioid users, the opioid replacements mm -hmm. or harm reduction. Which has um, cost the state an absolute it's crazy. Fall. And it's, again, it's not, um, why, it's not openly available, that information, but if you go looking for it and you see how much it actually costs the government, it is and then you've got scale. harm reduction is what the big everyone's talking about harm reduction just now and harm reduction is important um it 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 saves lives but the reason that they're focused on it is because it's very easy to measure um you know you know how many people you've had on a safe using den or mm -hmm. um you, you know how many people um you know like delivering the naloxone and things like that but and they can count how many lives they've saved. So it's very easy for them to mm -hmm. use data to prove mm -hmm. that they're doing something. But the reality is you might save 100 lives on a Friday night and you might save 100 lives the next Friday night, but how many of those 100 people are the same people? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and for me, harm reduction is really important, but it's not recovering. You need to engage these people in recovering. And um, that doesn't need to... I, I'm, I, I've used... Uh, smart recovery, which is sort of CBT based, and I've used twelve step recovery, which is sort of more power based and more spiritual. Mm -hmm. um, I love the twelve step, the, the whole everything yeah, about it. I love it as well, but I, I know mm -hmm. I also know it's not for everybody. Yeah, um, no, I know that. And that's too. where things like smart mm -hmm. recovery are also important because they focus more on behavioural stuff. Um, but it's just they're both abstinence based programs, and to me, there should be more focus on those type of programs for people. Um, and that's, that's all about therapy. It's the mental, yeah. emotional, mind, all that sort sort of stuff that does need investment. We Definitely. need to invest a huge amount in it. Um, so, so you've talked about the twelve step process, and that is one that's probably again more commonly known for um, alcohol addicts just because that's again what society seems yep. to think that it is but I know from personal experience friends of mine you know and myself I've looked at it um, exactly what it is and it can suit anybody and actually you don't even need to be and I'm just going to say this because again I think people think this an addict of anything to go down the 12 step um, you know, yep. recovery process because it's very much, as you say, based on your spirit, your, your, the spiritual side, you know, and accepting who you are. Yep. Um, so... Russell I, Brand's got a great version of the 12 steps. I don't know if you've ever oh seen no, that. Oh, no, I've not. I think somebody said that to so me, he's though. he's taken basically any mention of um, of God and any mention of sort of drinking drugs out of it, and it's very much the Aye. first step is, like, are you fucked? <laughs> exactly that's that's the best way to put it and that proves my point it isn't about any addiction if you feel emotionally that you are fucked it is something i think well yep. worth investing your time and look reading into it looking into it Definitely. whatever so how did you get into that then danny how did you go from <clears throat> the chaos and the 10 years of being in chaos to then getting involved with the 12 step recovery process? I think I just had, um, I don't really know, there was a, a it was funny because towards the end I'd started trying to cut down and I'd got a bit better and I'd went a few weeks without using drugs and then, and I thought I'd cracked it and then there was one night where, and it wasn't my worst using in, in any shape or, you know, mm -hmm. um, or way but there was one night, I haven't thought I'd cracked it, I had a bad night and I just so suddenly realised um, I'm never going to be able to do this on my own. Um, so I reached out to somebody on social media, um, on Twitter, um, somebody actually with a very large following um, who had had, who publicly speaks about addiction um, and they turned up at my door the next day with uh, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, which is what the 12 step programme is based off of. Um, and I think that's why there's a, like, people believe that, that that's what it's yeah. for. But so they turned up mm -hmm. the next day with that and a little yellow pamphlet that I gave to Stay Sober. 
and he started taking me through the steps. Um, and with that, I started going to uh, recovery meetings um, and getting a bit of fellowship about me. And that's kind of where I've, I discovered the importance of connection. Mm -hmm. So um, that's where I've like, I, I, I can't remember who says, whose quote this is, but I don't, um, basically the opposite of addiction is connection. Yeah, do you, so I had a girl in my, that I know in my car a good few weeks ago, uh, Kirsty, who is a recovering alcohol addict as well, and she quoted that. That and I had never heard it till she quoted it. So yeah. it totally. Well, as soon as I heard it, I resonated with it like totally because it's that connection with other people. I think that really gets you through anything, anything yeah. at all. Reaching out, speaking. It's one of the reasons I do this. Speaking to people, just the conversations, and you know, people out there will be able to connect be your story or part of your story and it's it's that wee bit of connection that I believe gives somebody, anybody, a bit of hope yeah. for the future. So see when you started your recovery process, was that you was that you on it? Was that you for you know discovering the twelve step process? You never went back? or took any steps back you've always been moving forward always been moving forward um well done that's excellent so that was two and a half years ago two and a half years uh -huh. well that was two years so i'd managed to cut the cocaine out myself pretty much um, for six months for a, about five and a half months and can i just say uh it's no um unnoticed on me that that was also throughout a most horrendous pandemic that you managed to yeah. uh, stay off it as well because I was thinking about that on my way here because if you read the stats about um, people with addiction post uh, COVID it's a huge yep. percentage of relapse again figures that are not easily available but if you go looking for it you'll find it I think I was quite actually like my circumstances in the during the pandemic were were quite fortunate. I changed jobs in February just before the pandemic hit, and I went into this industry. And as a result of that, we you know we're in the supply chain for the NHS, mm -hmm. we're in the supply chain for food testing, drink testing, water testing. So, so the universe was looking out for you. Basically, then. I was working mm -hmm. nine to five in the office every day during the whole pandemic, and. At the time, I was looking at my pals all like, I'm at that fucking... <laughs> Riley, like, what's going on here? Like, and then I think it's probably the best mm. weather for those two years that Scotland's mm. ever seen. And I've just people sitting in their garden every day. And I'm like... I don't look at it now, it's brutal. I can't, I can't believe I'm in work every day. But uh, looking back, um, having a routine, my routine not being broken, still going to work every day, um, and actually being sort of confined to the house because I took the restrictions pretty seriously for the first sort of six months to a year um, like that actually probably helped me in a way but I know a mm. lot of people who really struggled through the pandemic mm -hmm. people who weren't working who suddenly had all this free time and who were still getting furlough money so they you know mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. weren't having to pay for fuel um, but suddenly had all this money and uh, so I know a lot of people who's got got worse during the pandemic um, so I don't you know completely understandable that people got worse but my experience mm -hmm. actually was that just because of the circumstances that I had um, I found it pretty easy mm -hmm. which is Not good easy, but, mm -hmm. yeah, a god send like, you'll be grateful for yeah, that definitely. Mm -hmm. um, so I know that you, you do well, before I go into the work that you actually do, because you've got your own wee group and whatever to help people, but you still, you're quite open with the fact that you still struggle with not the addiction side yet, but your mental health. Yeah. Um, you're dead open about that. Um, and that was how I discovered you, because, you know, you were saying stuff that even I could relate to, and I'm not a recovering addict, but I think mental health, there's a lot of universal aspects Definitely. of that. Um, 
and you're still very open about how you feel and how you tackle your mental health and whatever. So, because I, I would, I don't want this to come across like, oh, you're all rosy in the garden now, and I don't think you would want that to come across either, no, because you not. still work extremely hard on keeping yourself afloat, basically, yeah. like a lot of us do. But so you still go to your meetings. So I just wanted to quickly ask you about that because. How do you find out about those meetings if you wanted to go? If somebody wanted to go to a meeting, what's the best thing to do to find out? A 12-step so, process meeting I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's, an, so it's an interesting one because we're not really supposed to... In the, are they in still the, not having them? No, they are. They're on. But right. in, in the traditions of the fellowship, you're not supposed to promote, promote it. it. Right. Well, I'm supposed not in to it. be self-sought. So, oh, right. Oh, okay. If somebody's looking for help, um, at the fellowships that I go to, or have been to in the past, I, I have gone to Alcoholics Anonymous. Mm -hmm. I've gone to Cocaine Anonymous. Um, I'm also aware of Narcotics Anonymous. Those are the three big 12-step based recovery programs for people with alcohol or drug addiction. Um, Alcoholics Anonymous focuses on alcohol. Narcotics Anonymous focuses on drugs. Mm -hmm. Cocaine Anonymous, despite the name, focuses on any mind or substance. So you can go if you've never tried cocaine, you know, it's yeah, for anybody that's go. had any mind or right. substance. Um, and then you've got the, the smart recovery meetings. Um, the are growing in the UK, which is great. There's a lot more of them happening in, in Scotland um, over the last sort of six to 12 months. Um, but all, f all four of those sort of um, abstinence-based fellowships can be found online so um just mm -hmm. like go onto it yeah and they have either on the website you can find meetings or there's helpline numbers and you can phone and somebody will come and meet you and they'll take you to a meeting mm -hmm. um or you know reach out to me mm -hmm. well I'm what to just people. were you saying <clears throat> that there then what i was going to actually do um was so what i do when i put this out i, I invite the person as a collaborator so what that means is if you accept it, it would go on your actual grid. But I was thinking Sonder Connects would be the place that you would want this to go. Yeah. So if I do that, that then puts Sonder Connects out there. You're saying people reach out to you. You you run that page. So if people wanted to yeah. reach out to you, that would be the place to do it. So I'll, that's what I'll do then, yeah. if that's what you want. Right, so coming on to that, because I did want to talk about that as well, and I see you've got your sweatshirt on, although I don't think Andy can see it. Are you putting a window down, by the way? It is getting a wee bit warm in here, but it's pure blowing an absolute gale outside. Um, Are you all right? Mean, you, all right, no, as so long as you're all right. Aye. I just don't want you sitting sweating and like going, oh my God, I wish I'd put the window down. <laughs> so that's fine. Um, so I so on to the, the uh, a positive thing that's come out of this, um, is that you run, and again, this is where, I don't know how this actually happened, how I managed to connect the Twitter to the Sonder Connects. I think you followed me in Sonder Connects, and I'm like, oh, that's that guy for that. Twitter. So <laughs> I, that was, but I already knew you when that I happened. That I know, I've known, and it's a good, I would say, Danny, two years, I think, that I have known you on Twitter. So, um, but I'm just a wee, I'm just an observer. I'm just a creep on Twitter. <laughs> I just look at stuff, no like Instagram where I, I do take part in it. But no, I just look on Twitter because Twitter absolutely frightens, I said this to you, frightens the whole life out of me. It just, I see so many yeah. aggressive, horrible, just downright bastard comments that I think, oh no, I couldn't be doing with that. So that's why I don't get involved in it, but I have followed you for a couple of years. But anyway, your um, Sonder Connects is something that I do as well. It is a page all about um, mental health and the cold water dipping, which yeah. I love. I can't recommend that enough. I don't do enough of it, but I do love it. Um, and I noticed that you're doing a, a few different things now you're doing. Yeah. Will you tell us about it? Well, so Sonder, um, basically, myself and my, and my friend Mary Claire, who I also actually met on Twitter um, as well. So, you know, as much as I also can sometimes hate Twitter, it's like a lot of things in my life wouldn't have happened without certain people mm -hmm. I'd met online. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I totally agree. But I met Mary Claire MC, and she's known as on Twitter, and we met up for... Um, I recognise her, I must have seen stuff with her as well. Then. You might follow mm -hmm. her, maybe. Mm -hmm. Aye, she's mm -hmm. quite... 
in terms of like she doesn't have a big following either but those like there's a, a good core one thing that twitter is good for is there's a good core sort of community on there focused on sort of recovery from addiction or mental health adverse mm -hmm. childhood experiences psychological trauma there's a really good Mm -hmm. community on there mm -hmm. people yeah i see loads um, of stuff and everyone who follows each other they'll talk to each Aye. other you know whether it be about resilience or about adverse children experience or whatever um so that's kind of how i knew marie claire mc and we just we met up and went for a hill walk one day and um i'd been going along to other groups who do sort of hill walking and cold water therapy and things like that but marie claire and i met up i just felt immediately like i was able to tell her absolutely everything that ever happened in my life and it was the same with her and it was like we'd known each other forever and it was just this kind of just felt safe mm -hmm. um and and everybody needs that everybody needs somebody needs a friend yeah. or somebody where you do feel that you can say and we'd, anything in your say we'd met up a couple of times and pals had came along once or twice and it was just kind of like we just felt like there was something here that we could try and give to other people Mm -hmm. Um, and that's when we started Sonder and so the two of you used to do it. The two of us do it, right? We actually there's a committee of four people, um, who run it. It's co-produced, which means that everybody that comes to Sonder is involved in running it in some way. Mm -hmm. So that's important to us. It, it'll always be that way. It'll always be peer-led, and it'll always be people with lived experience. Um, so everyone that comes along will help run it. Mm -hmm. we, had, we had a stall yesterday at an event up in. Um, Venica and mm -hmm. it was people who come along that helped man the stall. You know, it'll always be, we'll never have volunteers from outside, or mm -hmm. that's the way I would like to keep it is that everyone that comes along contributes to it. But you are but, the person that runs <clears throat> the page just in case anybody reaches yes, out. So yes, I run right. the Instagram, mm -hmm. Facebook, and the Twitter pages um, myself. Um, Marie Claire also, she's not on Instagram, but she runs Facebook and Twitter, so we're one right. of us two that would okay. probably reply. But you're the one on Instagram. But I'm the one on Instagram, Sorry. yeah. So, um, but we, so we started Sonder in November last year. Um, we decided, is it as recent as that? Yeah, it's really Oh my new. God, I feel like that's been on Instagram forever as well, I but uh, you do loads of stuff then. Um, yeah. Wait, actually, like, it's almost, it's got to a point where it runs itself and it's kind of hard, like, mm -hmm. keeping up with it rather than anything else, but um, we started it in November gave herself very little time to actually like well like because what i've discovered about myself is that if i've got an open timeline nothing gets done mm -hmm. um so i was like right let's just we'll do the first walk on the i think it was the 4th of november mm -hmm. and this was on the we this was the 26th of october that we decided we were going to do this and i'm like mm -hmm. let's just pick a date and then because <laughs> i can i can Aye. make stuff happen if i if i need to mm -hmm. but if i don't need to if there's no like date in place i'm just very mm, whatever and that's what i've learned about myself recently um it's, i've been referred to as i said i've been referred to a psychiatrist for an adhd assessment and it's probably that's probably part of that but mm -hmm. um so yeah we, we did the first walk so we do a walk that's that was the first event on a saturday we started fortnightly notes weekly mm -hmm. and what we do on a saturday is a walk talk and dip event so we do a hill walk most saturdays it's ben ann then we go along to loch venica and we do a bit of cold water therapy so we get in the water and um, it's all about being in nature hill walk into the water um, and then after the water we set a campfire and we get round in a circle and we do a share a group share and we do two rounds or three rounds sometimes and there'll be questions so the first question is normally something like how are you what's on your mind very open um, nobody's under any pressure to share some people come along and they don't want to share they just want to listen that's fine some people don't dip either, do they? Some just people come don't just dip. To... Some people don't do the walk. Yep. Um, no, no part of it's, you know, it's a, some you folk just turn want. up to the lock just for the share. Some people just do the walk. They don't mm -hmm. want to do the dip in the share. You'll get something from all of it if you just want to, you know, and there's no pressure to turn up to all of it or any of it. Um, but uh, the, the shares, that's my favourite part. That's the bit um, where we'll do like a round look and we'll go around everybody. Because that's where the real connection happens. It like is. I was saying. And we always um we always ask who wants to start. And normally it'll be somebody that's been a few times. Um and then we'll ask the, the group what direction do you want to go in? Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. out of the two people left and mm-hmm. right, who wants to go next mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. so that nobody feels under any pressure but importantly asking who wants to start lets people who are maybe new or who have been that often hear someone else share um, and there's something magical about hearing somebody else being honest and open um, and it doesn't have to be negative sometimes and it's really nice some weeks everybody's like i've had a great week mm-hmm. and that's just as important to share as anything else because somebody that's struggling maybe seen you the week before and you're having a shite week mm-hmm. and they see you this week and you're like things have been good and they're like things could be good for me as well kind of thing mm-hmm. so we're not doom and gloom so we do that no then. i didn't think that no. you do <laughs> mental health groups generally aren't they're no, just it, they're just totally honest uh, real life. And we always try and finish with a gratitude round. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah. something just have to find something to be grateful for. So we'll normally say, give me something you're grateful for or something you've learned recently. Mm-hmm. But even being people, there is something to be grateful for. Well, some actually some there's always somebody most weeks who says they're grateful mm-hmm. for the group. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm grateful for the group because it gives I get as much out as a as a maybe mm-hmm. give to others in a in a feel it's important to tell other people that because mm-hmm. that's how I feel about along. this yeah mm-hmm. it's aye, great, isn't it? aye. so it's not just about because people always message me and I'm sure you get this, get this saying thank you so much for doing that it's amazing that you do that and it's amazing that you do this and I kind of I do get that pang of guilt because I think but I do do it for myself as well you yeah. know but I tell them that you know I say that it helps me just as much yeah. as it helps anybody else well, that's the so the twelve step process. The the twelve step is you carry the message mm-hmm. to somebody else. That's the twelve step in the twelve step program, and you continue to do that for the rest of your life, and um, because helping others helps you. Mm-hmm. That's kind of that makes me feel dead emotional. I didn't actually know that was part of the twelve step. Yeah, that's process, the last step. But I, I'm just following my gut. Carry the message mm-hmm. to the newcomer. So and mm-hmm. in, in the in the rooms, that's what you, that's the twelve step. But really, it's just about you help the next person. Mm-hmm. And you don't need to be years ahead to help the next person. You can be a day ahead to help the next person. You know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you don't need to be. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't even think of that. I I just think about sharing. Yeah. You know that's just what I think. Um, conscious of time because we've only got like ten minutes left. I wanted to ask you about the ADHD, but we'll finish on Sonder again because I want to make sure that that's the final message that goes out because people can yeah. connect if they want to. Um, so the ADHD, how did you get referred? Because my God, man, it is so hard to get a referral for that. How did you? That's why I haven't went down the road. But then I also think that I really need it because what difference would it make to my life because yeah. you're self-employed. <clears throat> but tell me how you... Can I be honest? Aye. Like, <laughs> Please. It, it was, for me... It was really fucking easy. Oh, was it? And what I, did you do then? I was like, and I, 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 so something I can do in my lifestyle is I have arguments in my head and all that that don't ever happen. Don't be old. Right? <laughs> yeah. I'm like that. I, this is going to be fucking hard. <laughs> and I had rehearsed the phone call I was going to have with the GP mm-hmm. and everything in my head. I know exactly um, what you mean. I have them all the time. And I went on the phone <laughs> to the GP reception. So you just phoned your doctor? I'd already had an argument with in my head an hour before. <laughs> and I said... I'd, I'd like to try and get an appointment with the GP because I think I've got ADHD and she went okay I'll get somebody to phone you and the GP phoned me and she said why do you think you've got ADHD and I told her a wee bit and then she went through a list of questions Um, I'd actually already done, done these I found them online it's a self referral somebody sent me it Danny I've got that in my so inbox uh, I'd already filled all that out uh, thinking I, I might need, need it, it but she'd done it with me anyway Um, so there's an A section and a B section and then there was maybe five questions in the first section and maybe ten in the second and it's a, it's a marker system they're basically sort of ten but the first section is like literally scored and the second lot of questions is more about because which i think is a good thing some people might not score that high in the in the i'm saying that like it's an exam you want to win but some, <laughs> some people might not score that high in the in the indicators uh-huh. but the second lot of questions helps the gp understand more about day-to-day life for you to then if mm-hmm. you don't score that high they can still refer you mm-hmm. um but it's marked out of 10 and i've scored seven things the best i've done in exams <laughs> right so the highest so it the, is the, yeah. the higher it is the more likelihood you are to yeah. be on the spectrum so i'm uh, conscious that i don't i might not have adhd mm-hmm. i'm mm-hmm. waiting on a psychiatric assessment and um, i've been waiting about seven or eight weeks so that is the where the weight that is. is the difficult part Aye. Right. So my, I've had my referral, 
Mm-hmm. I don't know, the next stage of the process might be difficult, and but getting the referral from the GP was quite, was quite, quite easy. easy. Right. So see that, so that that uh, questionnaire thing that you're talking about, that's what the GP uses that you can actually find online it and do it this, yourself? It was, I can't remember if it was exactly the same, but it's very, but very, very similar. similar questions. Right. And do you mind me asking, what kind of stuff does it ask you? What is it that they're asking you to identify initially if um, you have to get a referral? Things like, do you have difficulty completing tasks? <laughs> um, yes. Do you find yourself leaving your desk, so if, if or, or your work environment when you sh- shouldn't, mm-hmm. kind of thing? Um, Is there a thing in it about like I've got this thing, and I work with my husband, right? And it's brutal because that just makes <laughs> it like a million times worse. Like he'll ask me to do something, and it's just that it doesn't. Regardless of what the task is that he's asked me to do, like for the business, my automatic is like, no, no, I'm not doing it. I don't want it. I shouldn't be doing it. I'm not doing that. That's too much. It's almost like immediate yeah. overwhelm. But actually, when you pull yourself back, it's fuck all, right? But you've created this massive, you know, like he's asked you to do this one task. And to me, what that feels like is this big, huge boulder being yeah. placed on you. With all the other 14 million boulders that you've got, and it's like a, just an instant reaction of my brain is telling me I can't cope with it anymore, so no, I'm not taking your letter to the post office to get posted. Uh, you know, like that's what... Is that, is that something, the kind of thing? I don't I don't know. I, I can identify with that kind of feeling, but I don't uh, know if that's... Some are right. So it's not in the questionnaire. It's it's not well. I mean, there's kind of indicators like finishing a task or um, Mm -hmm. those kind of. I can't. I can't remember them all now. um, To be honest, but the the finishing task one sticks out to me because I can do all the like heavy work. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I can like, I'll I'll bring it to Sonder for example. So we were just at a a festival up in Venica there, um, and I had done absolutely everything. That mm-hmm. I needed to do. Mm-hmm. I'd spoken to the woman. Um, she'd sent me this. She sent me a form, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, send this back when you can, kind of thing. I bought all the stuff that we wanted to sell on the stall. Um, I'd ordered new hats. I'd uh, mm-hmm. organised who was going to be there to help me out. I'd got you know, worked out the cars, what cars we're going to take, because the women wanted to know the registration numbers for the cars mm-hmm. that were going to be parked there. I'd done all that. I hadn't sent the fucking form. I can't do the last bit of anything. Mm-hmm. I'd do all the prep, and then the easy bit. I'd fill the form out. <laughs> you I'd just hit the out. button. <laughs> you can just hit like the that. button. What, why? My, my brain's like that. I just send it later. You just forgot then, it's just like in your mind to oh, you. No, I remembered a lot, but quite no, often I remember. I haven't sent that form yet. I'll send I... it later. <laughs> I'm like, what is the problem? What's, you know? And I'm like, why don't you just fucking send it now? <laughs> but see, without yeah. a deadline, that's kind of where my head goes. I've not got a deadline anyway. I'll send it later. Yes, it doesn't matter. So there's like no um, importance because on she it in never said get it back to me by this date. Mm-hmm. So I, I actually didn't send it to her until last Friday. I had it for about four weeks. And I never heard back from her. And all week, I'm like, I don't even know if I'm actually going to go to this festival. Luckily, we we have our dip up at Loch Venneker, and the venue was Venneker Lochside, which is three minutes down the road. So I was like, if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. I'd kind of accepted that. I've stopped stressing so much about stuff like that recently. Um, like, I was just like, if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. And it would be my fault if it doesn't happen, and that's fine. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've accepted that that's part of my me now, but I was kind of like as well. Like, why can't I just send a fucking form when I'm meant to send a form? Um, so that's kind of where I'm at with the ADHD and like you, I'm not that. I'm actually not that bothered about a label. Or it doesn't really matter to me what's wrong mm-hmm. with me. Mm-hmm. Um, if I like, because I got diagnosed with a, a different. Um, mental health disorder about 18 months ago borderline personality disorder um i don't actually i now don't really know i don't necessarily think i do have that now haven't looked mm-hmm. further into it um mm-hmm. i think a lot of what was picked up as bpd is probably an adhd symptom but 
what I have doesn't matter to me. Mm -hmm. I actually don't need the identifier. But what it would help with is um, getting additional support. Mm -hmm. That is why, that is exactly, even in schools, that's what it comes down to yeah. if you're getting a child diagnosed. And I know there's a lot of controversy about labels, and that's a decision as a parent you need to make. Do you want to... Yeah. Uh, give your child that label purely for getting the support or do you feel that they don't need the support so you don't need to go down that road you know that's down to the individual whatever yeah. you do but that is what it boils down to you to get support you need to have the diagnosis yeah. and so, i think that's wrong mm -hmm. why can we not just be compassionate and, 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 and look after people understand uh, that everybody's different and everybody learns in different ways and everybody will operate in different ways and why can we just make allowances for everybody mm -hmm. And be like, you know, because what is normal? Normal doesn't exist. No, no, it doesn't. And I don't think like things like I don't think lazy exists either. Mm -hmm. You know, lazy is a is a descriptor for somebody. People are like, if somebody's t turning up late for an appointment, I was late for you this morning. That's because I've like right. I've I've been up since. Uh, but I knew you were but you also messaged me at 10 o'clock last night Danny so I knew you were coming yeah. so but that's you but take that's everything kinda, into account there that's kind of where I, I used to beat myself up for stuff like that um, I, and I, this no, this, this might sound like some people would take this the wrong way but I don't care anymore I don't feel mm -hmm. guilt for being late because that's part of who I am mm -hmm. um, no, I but know, I don't think it's rude but it, but to they me, don't, they, don't see, aye, they don't see me pacing up and down my hall. I I was just going to say you for are 40 beating yourself. To leave the house. Aye. So to, I've, I don't have any guilt anymore. No. Like, I was ready to leave the house. I just fucking couldn't get the key in the door. <laughs> <laughs> At least you're honest. So. That's the main thing. No, but you're like so for me as on the other end of that you being late, it did not bother me one bit that you were late because, like I say, the whole picture is. I've had quite a conversation with you prior to you coming here today. Yeah. I'm then going to my bed last night and get a message for you, checking that you're still to come here the day. So when I'm here and you message me saying, I'm really sorry, I'm going to be 10 minutes late. I'm not thinking, you know, oh, what an absolute yeah. clown this guy is at, at all. Because I've already got all the... Yeah the stuff behind before this moment happened so it's taking everything into account you know you know I yourself used to think that, I, I used I, to judge everybody and now I'm oh. just and, I, and that do you know what that didn't it I actually somebody somebody said to me recently that have, take, having a resentment for somebody is like taking a poison and hoping it kills the other person because me, right. me judging aye. somebody or being resentful against somebody or being like fuck them or whatever it doesn't hurt them. Aye. They no. don't, they don't know. Mm -hmm. Aye. Exactly. I know, I know. You could be sat and raging at somebody and that person's living the life of, you know, have, living the dream and they've no idea that you are annoyed at them or, you know, yeah. angry, whatever. It's you. You're, all you're doing is completely eating yourself alive, like you say, anyway. We're at 58 minutes, Danny. I just want to say thank you so much for getting into a complete stranger's car <laughs> and letting me chat to you and record it um the sonder connects will be the the main collaborator for this and um i know that you welcome everybody and anybody that wants to come along to your yeah. um groups so i thank you so much yeah, and, thank uh, you for asking me you I are really most welcome um, yes thanks for the coffee <laughs> you're welcome see you later see you later bye, bye.